book, you talk about how people become polarized, and I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit more in the polarized, what you mean by polarized mind. Polarization is the fixation on a single point of view to the utter exclusion of competing points of view. And for me, what I've come around to is that is possibly the core problem. I call it a plague, psychological plague of humanity. And it gets repeated over and over again through history and in our contemporary lives. And I think you also see the relevance to psychotherapy, to psychological breakdown, individual breakdown as well as cultural breakdown. When a culture or an individual gets to a place that they so identify with one single view, it's a recipe for either a breakdown or a tyranny of some kind. And the tyranny can be cultural, it can manifest in wars, in ethnic hatreds, uh, in us-them, religion, many manifestations. But it can also manifest in the individual's life, uh, grandiosity, narcissism, designing one's whole life around avoiding fragility and smallness, which is our birth, birthright. It's a part of inherent to living, it seems to me. Uh, it's cutting off the paradoxes of our lives. And again, I feel like we're born into paradox. We're food for worms and soaring angels at the same time. And that's our crazy condition. And if you cut off one or the other, you've lopped off a vital, a vital organ, a, vi a vital piece of your humanity. And what I've seen in this book what I look at is how power centers and their, and their leaders, beginning right from the earliest writings in Babylon, have become polarized. I've really uh, uh, scrutinized this from an existential point of view. And there's been a lot of works about extremism, fascism, polarization, from economic points of view, from evolutionary theory, uh, from biological determinism, seems to me existential, basic existential conflicts have not been in the conversation nearly enough. And I have a sense that they're, if they're not the core, they're at the core of the problem. That the, the ultimate substrates of that kind of extremism, that fixation, is a sense of insignificance. It's a sense of cosmic helplessness. And you see in the leaders of these cultures and the cultures themselves, there's this kind of perfect storm where they're on parallel paths. The culture has been brutally wounded. Of course, Hitler and the Nazis is probably the classic example. Culture has taken a body blow. For example, the crashing of the German culture after World War I, the skyrocketing inflation, the humiliation, the ridicule by the acts of the Allied powers toward them, the devastation at Versailles, the Treaty at Versailles, where they get nothing, basically. Uh, and a culture coming from a pretty proud place, so the fall is hot, is long, Deeper, I should say. Mm -hmm. Hitler, as a kid, from everything I've read anyway, was brutalized. Father was as cold a bastard as one could be, it seems to me. Uh, talk about narcissistic parenting. You know, if, if he didn't, if Hitler didn't toe the line, he'd be slugged, he'd be smashed to the ground, he'd be humiliated. Uh, total emotional coldness in the family upbringing. 
Uh, I mean, Alice Miller has pointed out a number of these these problems, actually in the German culture as well. This was a kind of maybe exaggeration of mm -hmm. some of the very strict, rather aloof parenting practices that were in the culture. And that may have also contributed to this growing need, this desperate need, to design one's entire cultural and, in, and individual lifestyle around avoiding a sense of, of invisibility before life, before existence. Entire world design to avoid a realization that at some level we're nothing. We're decaying. We're a speck. So you can see this in a number of the brutal leaders and brutal cultures through history and uh, different circumstances. Sometimes the circumstances are more geographical or geological, prompt a culture to avoid a sense of vulnerability to that, build all kinds of defenses. Ernest Becker would call them immortality projects. He's a great inspiration for that work as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and right up to our own times, I, mean, I think uh, we see it manifest. I, I think we see it manifest uh, after 9-11, uh, when instead of uh, taking some time to reassess and grapple with the fuller circumstances of that horrific event, and I'm not denying it was horrific, we immediately closed ranks and immediately went for the military op option. And the whole country, or much of the country, got swept up in that. There were very few discussions about vulnerability at that point, it seems to me. A lot of discussions about big guns and shock and awe <laughs> in that military sense. Um, not much discussion about complexity of the situation. Not much therapeutic discussion. And yes, I guess I am unabashedly calling for a more therapeutic culture, for a culture that provides more helpful witnesses. Would have been nice if some of the political leaders could have been, you know, more like a Rollo May or, you know, a, a seasoned therapist, a depth therapist, who would call for some reassessment, ref reflection on the layers of issues involved in that event. In addition to protecting ourselves, I wouldn't deny that there's a place for, for protection, but this seemed to me to be reverse of protection in some ways. It, mm -hmm. This was all out aggression. So one of the things I discovered in this book is that without intervention, again, that, that crucial decision point where one is crushed by the trauma, without the intervention, one e either collapses into impotency or inflates into a kind of tyranny, often. And in both cases, there's very little ability to stay present to the fuller circumstance and to try to orient oneself to how do we proceed in a more whole-bodied way, more whole-bodied experience. What can we learn from the circumstance, too? And the second half of the book is devoted to some steps we can take, perhaps, to address this problem. <laughs>